Okay. Aldehyde ketone chemistry. Aldehyde ketone derivatives. Uh, we looked at hydrate, sanohydrate. Uh, we looked at acetal. Uh, what's an acetal? Okay, you should know that. All these functional uh, groups, derivatives of aldehyde ketones, you need to know. Uh, we made acetal here. Uh, let's look back at this. You should have the mechanism already. Okay, carbonyl chemistry, acid catalyst, strong acid. We protonate carbonyls with strong acid. We don't protonate carbonyls with water. Okay? Remember if you protonate carbonyls with water on the test. We protonate things with strong acid. This is a strong acid catalyst. So we got to this point. I'm not going to do stepwise. You have this. Uh, we added the ethanol. And after the ethanol added nucleophilic addition, we had Turns up, became OH, there's an ethyl there, and that became O ethyl with an H. We got to this point here. I've just nucleophilic addition of ethanol to a protonated carbonyl. What do we do next? H plus transfer. H plus transfer. And we, we, put, it, we put the H on there, took it off to here. Okay. Um, what acid did we use here? What's your favorite strong acid? <coughs> so we got HSO4 minus here. At any point, you can take the acid catalyst back. If we took it back here, and this is going to be new, we usually don't. I usually don't show lone pairs here. That's okay. We certainly don't just do something like that off into space. Okay. What does your arrow mean? Well, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, these can take the H, these electrons move here. If we just took the acid back here, we would get sort of a structure here. We've got a carbon with an OH and an OR. If the carbon had two OHs, it's a hydrate. If the carbon has two ORs, it's an acetal. Carbon has an OH and an OR. It's not an acetal. It's called a hemiacetal. And what does hemi mean? Half. So it's a half acetal. Okay? Half acetals are sometimes seen in sort of halfway between getting to the full acetal and eliminating the water. Eliminate this water, get another alcohol on there. Uh, half acetals aren't usually isolated, but sometimes they are seen, and we'll see a couple applications right now. The white handout. The sheet here with the carbohydrates. Uh, you'll learn carbohydrates in uh, more detail in biochemistry uh, with your Fisher projections. Uh, there is an error here. There's an OH here that's been left off for some reason. But in this carbohydrate, this is glucose. If this OH attacks the aldehyde, and you can do a kind of a ring, and this is that OH attacking the aldehyde, electrons over, this book had a couple of problems. They also have a problem here. But this gives a hemiacetal. Because that carbon right there has an OR, 
And then one of these is an H and one of them is an OH. That's kind of a very odd way to show this. But if that's an OH, you've got a carbon with OR, carbon with OH. The cyclic form of your carbohydrates is a half acetal. And your carbohydrates can exist in the open chain form or the cyclic <coughs> half acetal form. This is actually shown a little bit nicer down below, where right here, that's a half acetal. OR, OH, cyclic form. And then you can see how the OH can be down, it can be axial, or it can be equatorial, depending on how it is. It's called alpha glucose or beta glucose. So you'll see that again in biochemistry. Um, okay, so we looked at that mechanism. We talked about how to drive this reaction. You can drive it by removing water. The problem is if you try to want to distill the water out at the boiling point of 100, ethanol 78, ethanol will boil out first. Instead, you actually use a lot of ethanol, one of the reactants, and drive it to the right. Let's, let's start here. It's actually quite common to make cyclic acetals. Here's your acetal carbon. That carbon has two OR groups. The R groups happen to be bonded to each other. Cyclic acetal. Instead of using two equivalents of ethanol, we can use one molecule that has two OH groups in it. <clears throat> if we go from here, I'm not going to do a full mechanism, but we can envision getting to, here's the methyl. Here's the alcohol we add, electrons up. So this would be the half acetal. Alcohol is added, so you have carbon OH and OR. The R group happens to have another H, another OH. From there, let's finish out the mechanism and get to the cyclic form. What's the first step you want to do? We form this plus what? Water. Good. Water. Okay. We can pick up the mechanism here. What's next? Anytime you can make pi bond, kick off the leaving group, easy to do. And we get phenyl. this, loss of water. Now if you look back at the previous mechanism, we had, we had something just like this. At this point, we brought in another ethanol added here, and that's how we got the other ethanol here. Here, instead of bringing in another molecule, what do we bring in here? We have the other OH on the same molecule, and these electrons move in. These move here. And we can get
We have two carbons between the oxygens. That's a plus charge there. And then how do we get final product? We use paratyrene sulfonic acid. That means we have paratyrene sulfonate. And that can take the H electrons behind. And we get the final acetal with a five-membered green. That's a five-membered green. That's a five-membered green there. Uh, and that's a cyclic acetal. Everybody agree it's an acetal? It's carbon with two OR groups. And it's cyclic. Um, we need more clarity on our mechanisms. Uh, this arrow here is being left out by many people. Uh, what does this arrow right here mean? <coughs> These electrons are moving on to oxygen <coughs> and becoming the second long pair on that oxygen. Why are cyclic acetals uh, fairly common and actually preferred? Because the boiling point of this, that's ethylene glycol. That's in your radiator outside. Boiling point's about 198 degrees Celsius. What does this allow you to do? We can heat the reaction at 120 degrees. This doesn't boil out. But what does? The water. The water does. And so we can boil the water out. And we can drive the equilibrium by just distilling the water out as it forms. So the higher boiling alcohol makes it much more convenient to drive the reaction. This reaction is reversible, right? Don't forget, we are under Roman numeral two, right? Everything we're doing is reversible. How would you reverse this reaction? Well, practically, you would take this, treat it with water, and what else? Acid catalyst. Acid catalyst is required to come this way and to go backwards. So this and acid catalyst, what would that look like on your line reaction? H3O plus. Lots of water would drive it back the other way. Every alkali ketone derivative we're making can be driven back the other way. What would be the first step in going back the other way? That's quick. You go just the opposite. You'd protonate. After you protonate, what would you do? Anytime you make five bond Q couple leaving groups, it's easy to do. And at this point, it's, every step's reversible. Um, what do we have over here? We must have water. So water would add here. Now we get back to this structure. I mean, if under my hand was an H, that would be a protonated carbonyl. It sends a positive charge because it's got a carbon group on it. The water could add here. Every step is reversible. You should look at every step. In fact, you should sit down and draw this structure with H3O plus. And do the mechanism. Every carboxylic acid derivative can be converted back to a carboxylic acid. Every aldehyde ketone derivative can be converted back to the aldehyde or ketone. So that's a cyclic acetal. Okay, what are acetals good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> 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 
Acetals are good for, as protecting groups. What is a protecting group? It's a group that protects. Let's illustrate what we mean here. Okay, if you take this ketone ester, it's by two functional groups, beta keto ester, alpha beta, beta keto ester, with LAH, hydride source. Maybe you're trying to make A, I put a big X on it, but what are we doing? Looks like we're reducing the ester and not doing anything to the ketone. H minus adds, electrons up, back down, kick that off, give aldehyde. H minus adds again, electrons up, O minus, pick up an H. That's how you can get that. The problem is, if you try to react this with LAH, you're not going to get that. Instead, you're going to get this, because the H minus will also react over here. H minus adds, electrons up, this picks up an H. You're going to reduce both functional groups. Which functional group is more electrophilic? The ketone or the ester? Well, that's a methyl. What's its electronic properties? Donate. Donate. That's an oxygen. What's its electronic properties? It can do both. When oxygen does both, which does it do more? They both donate. How does this donate? Induction. How does that donate? Which is a stronger donation? Okay, so which carbon has more plus? The one on the left. Correct? Because this one donates more. It's like saying which one is the poorest carbon? The one that has a super rich friend or the one that just has a moderately rich friend? This guy's not as poor because it's got a friend that's really donating electrons. It's more partial positive here. That's the actually more, more electrophilic. Allies ketone is typically more reactive than esters, amides. If you react this, you're not going to get that. So how can we make A? If we first protect the ketone, what are we doing here? Diol with acid catalyst? What does this look like we're making? Cyclic acetal. you got to recognize, okay? Cyclic acetal would look like what? What size ring is the cyclic acetal going to be? B6. Right? Three carbons between the oxygens. One, two, three. Six member ring. This will make acid, cyclic acetal in the ketone. At this point, you can then react this with LAH, and you will get full reduction of the ester. Importantly, acetals are no longer electrophilic. Nucleophiles will not add here. The only way that this will react is under acidic conditions. You first have to protonate something, get something to leave. Okay? Non-reactive under basic conditions. Hydride will not react here. Here. We make this, that's just standard reduction of the ester. Now how can we convert this to the desired compound A? What do we need to do? Can we regenerate the carbonyl here? How do we regenerate the carbonyl up there? Water and what else? So can I show water and acid like this? We 
we, did we just reverse that up there? No. What did we use the acetal as? A protecting group. We protected the ketone as the acetal reacted it with LEA. See, the ketone's protected here. The ketone's not going to react. It's really not a ketone, but it's a protecting group. Then we liberate the carbonyl by reversing the reaction. That's called a protecting group strategy. It's a very common strategy in, in synthesis, organic synthesis. I imagine many of you don't understand why it's a six-member green. You need to look at this, okay? All right, five-member green, six-member green. Again, you're not gonna see everything right here in Five, five seconds, two minutes. Different size rings. Any questions about this protecting group strategy? Acetals can also actually protect diols. Because up here, Two, the two ingredients here are your allied ketone and your diol. When you make your acetal, the carbonyl is no longer there. We can regenerate it. We know how to regenerate it. What else is no longer there in your reactant? The two OHs of this molecule are no longer there. But we can treat this with aqueous acid and get back to two OHs and, and the ketone. So the, the two OHs are also protected. So down here we have another protecting group strategy where we protect the two OHs. You see, they don't have to be in a, just a three carbon OH, something like this. In this scenario, maybe you want to make a Grignard here. React this with magnesium, make Grignard. The problem is you really can't make this Grignard. As soon as you make it, one of these H's is going to transfer to the carbanion and you're going to get this. Either the O minus there or the O minus here. You cannot make a Grignard with an acidic proton around. Okay? That's a carbanion, right? This, these are acidic H's. You're just going to transfer the proton. So what do we need to do? We want to make a Grignard of this molecule. What we could do is we could protect the diol as an acetal. Now we have a diol. What other ingredient do we need to get an acetal? Some type of carbonyl compound, right? Carbonyl compound could be anything, but really that's the main portion. What about acetone? What do we get if we react this with acetone and ACO catalyst? This is sort of where a little memorization is good, okay? There is memorization in organic chemistry. It gets you started, prompting. What do you get when you react a diol and allied a ketone? Ac acetone, right? It's acetone chemistry, okay? What's the acetal going to look like? We're going to end up with two oxygens on this carbon instead of water. Let's see. Here's the carbon. Here's the two oxygens. What are they bonded to? Well, they're bonded to uh, this ring. Right? There's your acetal. If we if we go backwards, th that carbon would become what? Carbonyl, it would become acetone, and we would liberate the two OHs. But here's your acetal. Now we can make Grignard because we don't have the acidic OHs. Okay, and when you draw something that's supposed to be Maybe you want to show formula, okay? I see a lot of people doing Grignards like this, okay? 
just a lack of detail there. Okay? The magnesium is here and the Br is here. And we have our acetal. See, this green yarn is good. There's no acidic protons. <coughs> then maybe we want to react with epoxide. We can react with the epoxide. We can end up getting this here. How would we then liberate the two OHs? Plus, it's like we liberated the previous three or four examples. Um, so that's actually a protected group strategy for your for a dial as an acetal. How's the protecting group this work? Applications of acetal. Uh, it's actually on the warm up page. There's, there's a couple of drugs. Um, here's a, a corticosteroid used for. Uh, like uh, itching, skin itching. <coughs> so those are anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, called triamcinolone. It's also given as this form, or used. What's the difference? Up there we have two OHs. Right here you have, what type of functional group do you have here instead of two OHs? Acetal. How would you convert that drug to this drug? What reagent? No, H3O plus would you this to that. Yes. Do what? what How do you convert the top to the bottom? What's the carbonyl compound going to be? What's that called? Which are the high for ketone? on the carbon, we're going to have two oxygens there. Two oxygens there. That right there is an aldehyde ketone derivative. This comes from what? It comes from your OHs. Reacting with this, splitting out water. Oxygen's bonded there. Okay? You got to figure out how to see that. And the actual carbonyl would have two methyls. That is acetone. Acetals made from acetones are often called acetonides. That is triamcinolone acetonide. It's actually used as a uh, topical uh, cream. Uh, yeah, if you can see the uh, photo there. There's some other questions about that. Of why the, uh, what's the differences between using the diol versus the acetonide?
Okay. So that was acetals and half acetals. Acetals used to protect the groups. And there's some applications to drugs on that uh, warm up page. Uh, next functional group after acetals is going to be imines and enolines. You're acting aldehyde and ketone with an amine, amine, amine. If it's ammonia or primary amine, you get an imine. An imine is analogous to a carbonyl. Instead of C double bond O, it's C double bond N. And because N makes three bonds, you've got to have something else on the end. Here we're going to have an H. Here we're going to have a methyl. Just like making, we form water again. Well, let's look back and see how that's consistent. Uh, we're under B, actually we're under row number 2B, addition to the loss of water. The carbonyl oxygen has eventually lost its water. And so, in this reaction here, if you start with carbonyl oxygen, it's eventually lost as water. Mechanism. Let's do it with methyl <coughs> since I think there's a little more room down there. Uh, what's the first thing you want to do? Carbonate carbonyl. What's next? These mechanisms are, should be very intuitive at this point. There's really nothing new other than putting it all together and saying it's called an imine. What do you want to do next? The amine will excite. Nucleophile has propionated carbonyl. We've been doing that for three or four weeks now. Uh, I'm just going to call this R. Electrons up. The OH is a methyl. The nitrogen. Nitrogen has two H's and a methyl. And that's a plus charge. What do you want to do next? Proton transfer from where to where? This looks like a, an acidic proton. <coughs> Yes, we can do proton transfer. <laughs> Basically, take the H plus off of this long pair and put it on one of those long pairs. Give us something like this. What do you want to do next? So, okay, let's try that. Double bond to N with an H and a methyl, and that's a charge. I think week one of organic one, we learned how to determine charge, right? Maybe it was week two. Uh, what did we lose here? <coughs> There's the water that we said we were going for. Okay, what do we need to do to get the final product? 
Matt? We use HSO4 What acid did we use? H2O4. A strong acid. H plus catalyst is strong acid. Not water. Water is not an acid catalyst. Uh, instead of sulfuric, let's use another one. Okay, so there's a Cl minus here. Uh, Cl minus can then take the H and stay behind. That gives that. And HCl reformed. It still works with sulfuric acid, right? Any, any strong acids here? If you look back at, at the acid cal, we had something that looked like this at some point. Because there was no H on the oxygen, we couldn't take an H off and go neutral. So instead, another alcohol had to come in here and the electrons, this got more electrons this way. Here, because there's an H there, we can just lose the H and you just get to this point. So you don't bring in another amine. It's called an imine. What's another name for an imine? Maybe listen there. Shift base. I think it's talked about in the uh, fluorine lab. Uh, apparently, this guy's shift uh, really showed that imines are used a lot in biochemistry in your body. Because this long pair here is, is uh, what type of orbital is that long pair in? It's SP2, it's basic. Your body uses imines as bases a good bit. Shift recognize this. They call shift bases. Biochemists call them mean shift bases. Um, how, how do you push this reaction forward? This is the true equilibrium. Reversible. How do you push it forward? Remove water as it's formed. You can use excess. Hard to use excess amine because it's hard to get rid of and it. it's smelly and stuff. Um, Maybe some type of drying agent, basically the same old discussion. You made an imine in the lab by reacting your two amino fluorine with an aldehyde. You made an imine. How did you drive that reaction? You did not drive that reaction. All you did was heat it in ethanol. <clears throat> By the way, you actually did not even use an acid catalyst. All you did was combine the amine, the aldehyde, and ethanol and heat. And after heating it, the amine precipitates. Um, acid catalysts are not always necessary. In mechanisms, it's usually best to show it. It's easier. Um, the reason you did not have to drive your reaction in lab is because your imine was highly conjugated. I mean, if we show an imine, there's an imine right there. And so C double bond O is C double bond N. Uh, let's put something here. Maybe an aromatic ring. Let's put something here. Maybe another aromatic ring. Okay? Maybe this is part of fluorine. What is that? Two amino fluorine, aldehyde, maybe a pure fluoro. Here's the imine you made in the lab. There's the imine, but it's conjugated here and here. Conjugation all the way through here, I mean it's all the way around. This extended conjugation really makes the imine product stable. And that extra stability pushes it towards product. 
The more conjugation you can give this, the more stable it will be, and thus the more likely it is to, to go towards that side. So that's why you didn't have to drive it. And anything like this, you probably have to drive. It's not conjugated. If you had an amine, can you convert it back to the aldehyde or ketone? Sure. How would you do this? H3O plus. Water react with that to give these acid catalysts H3O plus. Uh, show the products of these reactions. <coughs> Here. Now, I'm not showing H plus catalyst. You can show that if you'd like. I'm not going to erase this right here. Okay, aldehyde ketone reacts with ammonia or primary amine. What do you get? Amine. In the amine reaction, we replace the oxygen with what? You gotta kind of boil it down. What, what are we doing here? Aren't we replacing the oxygen with the nitrogen? Essentially, what we're doing. But the oxygen is going to have one thing remaining on it. If they're all H's and we lose two because we're going to make H2O, we'll be left with an H. If we lose two H's and make H2O, what will be left on the nitrogen? You're not going to lose a bar group from the nitrogen, but you will lose the two H's. So what do we get down here? So here is my prime material. I'm going to replace the oxygen with the nitrogen. What's on the nitrogen? The benzyl. Now you do have a possibility of cis trans here because the benzyl can be on the same side of the methyl or opposite. Uh, so you do have with this uh, easy isomers. Or the oxygen you don't because there's nothing here to be cis or trans to anything. But you see this? So you do have potential for isomers with imines. Product down here. Instead of oxygen, what do we have? Nitrogen and what's on the nitrogen? Propyl. So there's your imine. What if we use a secondary amine? If we use a secondary amine, we don't get an imine, we get an imine. <clears throat> Back in the 80s, there was a rap star called Enamine. <laughs> Y'all know him? So what is an enamine? First off, ene, what does ene mean? Like an alkene. It's got an alkene. And what's on the alkene? An amine. So it's an ene with an amine. Ene amine. Ene amine. How do you get enamines? 
and, and I saved my structure and then I erased it. redraw the structure over here. Here it is right here. Double bond N methyl plus what did that have? An H on it? What was that? What is that up there? Methyl? Uh, methyl on a propyl? Like that? Yeah. That's what we had in that previous mechanism. If, you, if, if it's a primary mean, you have two H's. We've already lost one to get here. We can lose another. Or we can look at it this way. A secondary mean has two R groups. So if it had two R groups, this would be another methyl. And you can redraw this structure here. And so this, you get to the same point, previous mechanism, you just have an extra methyl all the way along. And at this point, there's no H to remove. We're not going to remove a methyl. What acid did we use? ACL? So this is Cl minus. There's no H to remove to make imine and to reform HCl. Instead, we remove an H from somewhere else. We're going to get this. Where do we remove an H from? Instead, we remove one of these. And the Cl minus, you take one of these H's. These electrons can move here, and these electrons can move out. And that gives nitrogen its lone pair. And right here, what are we making? We're making the carbon-carbon double bond. In the end, aldehyde ketones react with secondary means to get enamines. Aldehyde ketones do not react with tertiary means. You don't get any product. <clears throat> okay, guys. Um, key is posted. If you have any questions, please let me know. Please make sure you're learning from the test. Don't make the same mistakes on the final exam. Have a good week, guys.
Yeah, exactly. Thank <laughs> you. Video tape it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were being.